Hi, welcome back to General Chemistry 2. My name is Chuck White and today's lesson is on corrosion. We're going to talk about corrosion of iron and steel, which is a $300 billion per year problem in the United States alone. It's an amazing cost. We're going to talk about the chemical mechanism of corrosion, and we're going to talk about three main strategies for preventing or reducing corrosion of iron and steel. Now, the annual cost of corrosion, as I said, is three times 10 to the 11th dollars per year in the United States alone. That's an incredible amount of money. And uh, this estimate is made by uh, a study that was commissioned by the Federal Highway Administration in 2000 and 2001. Uh, there are many contributors to uh, this cost. The largest turns out to be the pipelines that carry water and sewage in our uh, municipal uh, systems in cities and towns. Uh, the second largest is motor vehicles, and uh, the, they, of course, rust and uh, need to be replaced. The third largest source of cost is the Defense Department, which has an enormous amount of iron and steel equipment that sits out the, in the rain most of the time. And then there's bridges and pipelines and aircraft and uh, uh, oil uh, refining and uh, uh, exploration equipment, uh, electrical utilities, all sorts of things, ships and aircraft uh, that uh, undergo a certain amount of corrosion and are very expensive to repair. So how does corrosion work? Uh, it turns out that uh, whenever iron or steel comes into contact with water and oxygen, uh, you can form anodic areas of the metal and cathodic areas of the metal. In an anodic area, oxidation of the metal takes place to form uh, iron 2 plus ions. In the cathode region, oxygen is reduced to form hydroxide ions, and then electrons have to run uh, through the metal from the anodic to the cathodic region. And so you get a little uh, electrochemical cell that uh, builds up and ends up pitting uh, the metal and uh, uh, having other places that act as cathodes to reduce oxygen. So the main reactions, the main half reactions, are the oxidation of iron, which has an oxidation potential of 0.447 volts, and the reduction of O2, which has a reduction potential of 0.401 volts under basic conditions, and the overall reaction of iron plus oxygen and water to form iron ions and hydroxide ions uh, has an overall cell potential of 0.85 volts, which, as we've seen before, is a very strong thermodynamic force uh, that converts reactants to products. Now, um, We've seen that the main corrosion reaction is spontaneous. It has a positive cell potential under basic conditions, but it's actually accelerated under acidic conditions because the hydroxide appears in the products. And so if you have acid present, that will decrease the hydroxide con concentration and increase the driving force for reaction, according to Le Chatelier's principle. Uh, to make matters worse, there is a secondary reaction of iron ions with oxygen and hydroxide ions, all, all uh, products of the uh, uh, main reaction, to form iron oxide hydrate, which is rust. And what this does it, is it prevents the hydroxide ions and the iron ions from accumulating on the surface and drives the main reaction even uh, further toward products. Uh, to make matters even worse, uh, it, when the pitting occurs in the anodic region, that increases the thermodynamic activity of the iron metal just slightly greater than unity, and it further accelerates uh, the corrosion process. So one thing that uh, you may have noticed uh, is that whenever slight pitting occurs in iron metal, the rust preferentially builds up in that area and um, increases the level of pitting rather than occurring uniformly throughout the metal. And that's because of this increase in the thermodynamic activity of the iron in the pitted regions. And so um, whenever you have a pit in metal and, and the beginnings of rust, you really have to act quickly to protect that area of the metal, otherwise it will rust through uh, very quickly. Now there are three uh, required ingredients for the formation of rust. Water, which is both a solvent for the aqueous ions, hydroxide and iron, iron 2 plus ions, and also a reactant in the reaction that forms uh, hydroxide ions. Uh, and oxygen, which is the main oxidizer in the uh, cathodic region of the of the metal. Uh, and thirdly, we need uh, electrolytes. So you need to have iron ion transport in water. 
And so what we've noticed is that in marine environments where you have salt in the air or in uh, areas of the country where they put salt on the roads in the wintertime, that greatly uh, accelerates the rusting of cars, for example, uh, because the salt water helps to provide this electrolyte which drives these electrochemical cells and the formation of rust on the surface of uh, iron and steel. So one way to protect um, the uh, metal from this oxidation is to uh, paint it or coat it with some sort of a polymer coating. And what that does is it prevents the water and to some extent the oxygen from coming into direct contact with the metal and it prevents the formation of this electrochemical cell. Uh, but one thing we have to realize is that even if you get a small pinhole in the paint or the polymer coating, that allows an anodic region to form and uh, then rust can form underneath the paint or the polymer which causes flaking of the paint and so uh, very rapidly you get an area of metal which is exposed and pitted and uh, the rust really starts to take over so uh, it's important whenever you use um, uh, coatings uh, or paint to protect metals to make sure that that coating and uh, uh, paint has, is robust and uh, doesn't have any holes or exposed uh, areas of the metal underneath. Some metals, like aluminum, form a very tough oxide coating. Aluminum forms aluminum oxide, or alumina, uh, that prevents further attack of the metal. So every bit of aluminum that's exposed to air has a very, very thin coat of aluminum oxide on the surface. Aluminum oxide is what rubies are made of, and so it's very, very tough, um, and uh, that helps to protect the underlying uh, uh, aluminum. Unfortunately, this doesn't work for iron because iron oxide is flaky, it's not tough, and in fact most of the time it's present as a hydrate, so it actually encourages the uh, formation and incorporation of water, uh, which promotes additional rust formation. Stainless steel is an alloy of steel that contains many metals including chromium and uh, chromium for example can form an oxide coating on the surface of stainless steel to protect the under underlying iron in the steel from further oxidation and so um, you can even paint uh, steel or iron with paints that contain uh, oxides of chromium or lead oxide, um, and that causes superficial oxidation of the surface and passivation of the surface. Um, but you have to be careful where you use these paints because uh, chromium, especially chromium-6, uh, and uh, lead oxide are uh, quite toxic, and so you have to make sure that these are used in environments where uh, they could not be accidentally ingested by humans or animals. The third uh, general strategy for prevention of oxidation of iron and steel is called sacrificial anode protection. And in this uh, strategy, you electrically connect the iron to a piece of magnesium or zinc uh, because these uh, two metals are more active, they have greater oxidation potentials than iron. And so when they're in electrical contact, they will be the preferred site of the anode. And so um, you can see the, the reduction potentials here, the oxidation potentials are, are the same, but just with the al opposite algebraic sign. And so magnesium, for example, has an oxidation potential of plus 2.372 volts, which is much, much larger than the 0.447 volts of iron. And so magnesium will be preferentially oxidized whenever it's in electrical contact with iron. So here's a picture of a of a sacrificial anode that's simply bolted to a ship's hull. And what that does is uh, instead of having the um, iron in the ship's hull uh, oxidized, the sacrificial anode is oxidized preferentially. Now, oxidation still occurs, and every once in a while you have to replace this uh, anode, but that's a lot cheaper than replacing the entire uh, hull of the ship. Similarly, in the water heater in your home, there is uh, an anode, which usually consists of zinc, uh, which uh, sticks down into the water, and it acts as a sacrificial anode. So you get some uh, zinc ions, which are deposited in uh, your hot water heater as a result 
result of these electrochemical cells. But what that does is it helps prevent the formation of rust on the inside of the main um, container of the hot water heater, and uh, that helps to, pre to prevent rust buildup in your hot water supply, and it also helps to prevent the pitting and eventual corrosion of the um, main container of your hot water heater, which would then just burst and leak all over the floor. So those anodes are really important, especially in areas that have uh, quite acidic uh, water. So next time we will talk about some more beneficial uses of electrochemistry, including electrometallurgy, electrolytic refining, electroplating, fuel cells, uh, pH meters, and uh, determination of equilibrium constants, especially solubility product constants. We'll see you then.